To start out, I want you to think about an assignment description for a writing assignment in one of your classes. And I want you, oh, not that one yet. I don't go too fast. <laughs> yep. We have a, okay. Thanks. Um, I want you to think about what the students submit. And I want you to think specifically about the assignments that miss the mark, that do not make the cut, that drive you nuts, that make all of your inner pet peeves just rile up with all of the anger of <laughs> something's wrong. And I want you to think about what those are. And I want you to raise your hand if this is one of your pet peeves. Um, we'll start with something simple, grammar. Students who have not proofread their paper one day. Raise your hand if that's something that bugs you. All right. Raise your hand if you have students turning in papers that have ideas that are just vomited onto the paper. They're scattered everywhere. Raise your hand if that's something that applies to you. What about students who only barely get surface deep? They don't dive into the um, full potential of the assignment. Raise your hand if that's a concern. You'll see that there are lots of concerns that teachers have about assignments and what students are submitting, and these are universal issues. This is not something that just English students have. They can happen in all departments. But I want to remind you for a moment what it's like to be a student. So, next slide. I have... Oh, in. We thank are, you. just ran out of the first one. Okay. So I will start passing out the second one, and I'm going to go on the other side, so at least we can get to campus. Thank you. I want you to remind, to remind you what it's like to be a student. So I have an assignment description up here, and I am going to read it out loud, and you are going to pretend that the next 30 minutes we're actually going to be writing this assignment, all right? In the popular television show, Star Trek Deep Space Nine, what do writers and producers wish to suggest about society? Do the different races of aliens have analogous groups in our contemporary society? What image does the show provide of law enforcement, of racial tendencies, of moral leadership? What ethical message does the show give its viewers? All right, most students only read through their assignment description once or twice, so you are now on the same level as a student. How many of you feel confident that you could start writing immediately on this prompt? Assuming I've watched it. Assuming you've watched it, yes. <laughs> Thank you. All right, if you feel like you could start, would you start with the first question and work your way down? Is there a theme that you feel like you could focus on? This frustration that you feel that you may not know where you're going, you might not know what's expected, you don't know if what you're going to turn in matches what a teacher might magically expect of you. Students feel this all the time and they come to the writing center and they bring these frustrations that they're trying but they don't know what they're doing. And a lot of that can be fixed with assignment descriptions. Next one. I don't know what I'm doing wrong. <laughs> Sorry. These are quotes from students who come in and talk to us about their frustrations. I took a cultural anthropology class, and in one unit, we were looking at how myths slash fairy tales exist across cultures. There was one assignment where we needed to find three fairy tales represented in different cultures and analyze and compare them. I totally missed that they wanted the same fairy tale as used by three different cultures and wrote my paper on three separate fairy tales. I don't think I failed the assignment, but I was embarrassed and wish I'd been able to learn what I was intended to learn. And the next one. The writing assignments for one of my entry-level business classes were awful. The essay prompts were confusing and cryptic. There were no clear expectation of what we were, supposed to, what we were required to do, so I ended up just writing extremely long essays to hopefully cover everything. <laughs> Does that sound familiar? <laughs> we get students who come in and they're frustrated. So what we're hoping today is to teach you two things and have you learn two concepts. We want you to know how to construct writing assignments that enable students to showcase both their content knowledge and their communication skills. Writing is a really important skill and whenever you look at lists of what's the most important skill a employer wants, communication is always at the tip top of the mark. And this is why writing is so important. But writing assignments have to be constructed in a way that helps students reach those goals, not hinder them. Okay, so the, the first thing we want to talk about is identifying a main goal. What do you want your students to learn? So think about what is your goal for that assignment? What, can you identify what you want them to learn? Um, so we're talking about content here um, in your class. 
What's the content that you want them to learn? What's your goal for the assignment? What's your purpose for the assignment? Okay, that's number one. We want them to do that. Um, we want you to do that. And then the next thing we want you to think about is what do you want your students to do with the assignment? Okay, um, do you want them, uh, what kind of genre do you want them to write in? And we're talking about maybe an essay and what kind of essay? Um, or is it a response on Canvas, a Canvas post that you want them to do? Are you going to ask them to do an annotated bibliography? So that's what I'm talking about when we, when we say genre. Um, the next one is scope. Do you want them to re reflect on just the class lecture for the day, maybe? Do you want them to think about the whole class in a final essay? How large is this? Um, is it two paragraphs? Is it ten pages? So what's the scope of the assignment? And then the writing skill. Uh, what, what will they be doing as far as a writing skill? And if you think about um, Bloom's taxonomy of, of knowledge where we have, uh, you know, you're defining, you're uh, applying, think of those verbs and use those in your assignment descriptions. Um, the writing skill, do you want them to analyze? Do you want them to create something? Uh, use those verbs and we'll give you some good examples of those in a minute. Um, this is one from my class that was kind of a mistake. When I got bad writing from this assignment, I realized, not, so, not bad writing, but just kind of bad ideas. There wasn't enough meat in this assignment um, for a writing, a writing assignment. It could have been something really short, maybe, or um, I think it would be better to do something like this in a, a think, pair, and, and share kind of thing in, in the classroom to help build community during that first week of class because my my learning goal or my uh, the main goal was to explore how culture shapes our our um, identity in these different ways and we were going to focus on personal identity and it seemed like a fine assignment but for you know a lot of points there wasn't just an, enough meat in there it would have been more useful to have it um, just a discussion in class, I think, or you know, pairing with a partner and discussing it rather than a writing assignment. So first of all, do you want this to be a writing assignment to match up with that learning goal that you have? Is it a writing assignment? Some strategies. State your purpose for the assignment. Going back to that, what do you want your students to learn? Um, here's an assignment description where it's very Clear. It's spelled out. The purpose of this assignment is to help you synthesize some difficult political theory and identify profound differences among key theorists. Okay. Um, let's go to the next one. State the task. What you want the students to do. So we're talking the first sentence there. Limiting your reading to your source book. There's the scope, right? When we're talking about what we want them to do. There's the scope of that. It's just in the source book. We're going to write a comparative analysis. So that's the genre that we're asking them to work on. And then we're giving them some of those key words, those verbs that they can pick out for writing skills, like synthesize <coughs> and identify. And that helps tremendously when they can pick out those, those words. Um, ask open-ended questions in your assignment description. Um, this is one that I uh, worked with last summer. Um, and this is one that we, my goal was, our goal was team teaching. Our goal was, was for the students to explore a topic. We were teaching the Benyon workshop on the literature of protests. And we wanted them to explore a topic that they would have for a, a a larger project, their final project, right? And so we wanted them to think about connecting their life story. Um, we wanted them to think about, um, what are some other verbs in there that I should have highlighted? Do you see some? Sparked. We want sparking your curiosity. 
um, things that are that we want you to investigate. We want what do you want to investigate about your family? So this is just a canvas post, right? And there's lots of questions there, but it's because it's an exploratory assignment. I'm not asking them to write a paper. I'm wanting them to explore different options for their assignment. So think about what your purpose is always first, and then possibly um, asking lots of questions. Here's some more um, from an assignment. This is from Yale Center for Teaching and Learning, and they've got a lot of good stuff that you might want to look at. And again, she says there, you don't have to answer all these questions. This is something to get you thinking, get your thought process going, get you started. Okay. Get narrow and specific with your assignment. When I, I kind of redid this, okay, I had that way of thinking, number one, what I wanted for my learning goal, connecting culture and identity. Um, I wanted to give them something a little meatier to work with. And one of my areas of focus is the, uh, the American West, and so I do, uh, we have a little unit on the American West. And I, so I thought, this is a good place to bring this in where we talk about national identity. And I'm asking them to connect uh, something from contemporary culture to what we've learned in the class. Okay, and there's scope there. I'm tried, and I'm still reworking this. Last night about 4 a.m. I was going, I've got to rework this some more. It's always about revision. We always revise everything. Um, okay, next one. That's you, Jazz. You're up. All right. Um, this is a concept that we talk a lot about. Um, we talk about a lot in the writing center. We focus on content before we focus on grammar. And a lot of people disagree with us initially with like, this idea, but I'm going to show you why this is so important. Okay, right here I have instructions. These are just instructions for employees to wash their hands. If you glance through it, you'll notice that there are a couple errors in here. So if you do the next one. So what I've done for you is I fixed the errors. I fixed all the grammar mistakes. We don't have any more incorrect words. We don't have misspellings. We've got correct punctuation. Life is perfect, right? Or maybe not so much. If we do the next one, what if I say it needs to be concise? It needs to fit on a sign. You can't have a massive paragraph sitting on the door, right? Um, and you'll notice that I get rid of things like thoroughly. Um, well, dry your hands with paper towels until hands are dry. Getting rid of repetition. Got rid of the explanation of what the garbage can looks like. Okay. Do you notice, though, that the time we spent correcting the grammar all of a sudden becomes inconsequential? Because we're going to get rid of that entire sentence completely. This is just a silly little example, but this happens on a large scale with student writing. The second a student thinks that their essay is grammatically perfect, their desire to change to make sure that they are concise, that they're not repetitive, is completely diminished. They don't want to make those changes because they think teachers think grammar means perfect writing. And I'll be honest, it's not. So next one. Good writing makes for good thinking. And um, that's what we encourage in students. If you can get them to really delve deep into strong content and you really emphasize that in your um, assignment descriptions, students know that that's the priority. The second they're relieved from thinking that you're going to go and tick off every single point for misplaced commas or a misplaced word, um, then they can really start to focus on the depth of the assignment. We train our tutors to look at this inverted triangle of priorities. We start with the content. We fix the content first, and then we go to organization all the way down to punctuation. And we do this so that students are willing to make those drastic changes. They're going to revise entire paragraphs, entire pages worth of information to make sure that the content is right, that you're getting the right information, and that they're communicating the most important concepts. And then, it's not to say that grammar is not important. That's just the last thing we touch on to make sure that everything else is in place. Um, we love our Lit Studies department in the English department because they have a rubric that they assign students and these are the eight points that appear on many of their rubrics. You'll notice that only two of them have to do with grammar. 
the first six items, these are all things related to higher level thought. We're talking about level of thought, logic of argument, textual evidence. This is how they're training English majors to be good writers, they're not drilling grammar into them per se. They're helping them get the content, the communication down first, and then they're working on semantics and grammar. So here. <laughs> Okay. All right, so here are some strategies so that you can help students do that. Um, the first one is to make sure the content and the layout reflect the importance of content and the importance of those learning outcomes that Susan talked about. I have an example here from one of our awesome teachers, Rachel Quisberg. This is a myth analysis project. The very first thing students see when they look at this assignment is content requirements. Do you see how she has expounded on all the important things that she wants in the content? This is just the first top part of the page. Next slide shows you the second half page. You'll notice that almost the entire first page of this assignment description delves into what kind of content she wants. What kind of research does she want? Um, give some examples, give students context for what they're working in. And then you'll notice in the tiny little corner in the side here, she's got some of the other stuff that is still important, but not as important as the content. Um, things like MLA formatting, paper, um, word count, those kinds of things. All right, the next thing is to have students submit drafts. But, next one. You don't have to read them, that's the nice part. Um, <laughs> we don't need more work for you, but we can help you get better drafts out of students. Peer feedback can be effective, but only if they know what they're looking for. If you just hand an essay to a student and say, give them feedback, they're gonna 90% of the time give incorrect grammar feedback, they're gonna give really poor advice about what to do or not do with the paper, and it becomes really, really bad. Um, most of the students who come in with peer feedback, we kind of cringe a little bit and go, oh, don't take too much stock in what your peer tells you because it's not really correct. Um, but, and one more click, um, one of your handouts is about doing peer feedback. And these are questions and tasks uh, that show you how to give students meaningful feedback and how to give each other meaningful feedback without focusing on grammar and um, all the little things that students magically pick up on. And these resources are also on our Writing Center website. Okay. okay. So the next thing we want to get to is simplify and clarify expectations when you're writing an ass assignment description. Um, Again, as Jaslyn's been talking about, the purpose of writing is to communicate ideas. <coughs> Go ahead. Um, and simplicity in assignment description does not produce simple writing. Um, you know, in the thesaurus, I, I looked up simplicity, and here's some words that, we, that are there. And that's what we want, right? Our, your students want that from you, and we want that from our students. We want them to be concise. We want it to be comprehensible. Straightforward, all those things. We all want clarity. We're always looking for clarity in our writing, right? Transparency, apparent. Your students are looking for that in your course, in your assignment descriptions. And to clarify, and I love these words from the thesaurus for clarify, to clarify, <coughs> to refine, distill. What are the things that they really need to know? What are the most important things? Again, going back to those goals, and what do we want them to do? Um, okay, this is a one that's going to look kind of like, ooh, this is hard, right? Look at that. Um, okay, go to the next one. Students are thinking, how am I supposed to structure this? What am I supposed to do? Okay, keep going. Some strategies. Scaffold your assignment, starting with the final assignment in mind and work your way up to it. Go ahead and I've got some models here, or examples. Assignment overview, this is what the whole thing is about, right? These are my goals, this is my purpose for doing this. And this is, these are for our um, English 2010, the final argument essay that they kind of work up to throughout the semester. 
that most of your the students are going to be doing that this this semester and it's a, it's fantastic I think we've got preliminary assignments we're going to do some pre researching on things we're going to have a conference we're going to have a proposal with bibliography it's really easy to see if you've got a, if you're working on a longer paper maybe you've got a long how many of you have long papers at the end or somewhere you've got a longer paper and you, so scaffold that assignment so they they have these little steps along the way. It also helps cut down on plagiarism if, if they're doing these steps along the way. Doesn't mean that you have to read everything. Um, some of these can be, you know, that you're kind of checking things off, if, if you, however you want to do that. But give them these steps. Okay, go ahead. Um, and there's it's kind of the rest of that. Um, and learning outcomes really important here. And I just wanted to point out, like for the English 2010 course objectives, we've gotten together. These are our course objectives that, that we've decided on. We also have research learning outcomes that we've worked with the librarians to, um, to come up with these learning outcomes. And then we've got idea um, outcomes as well. And, and this is all for the student to see so they'll know the why behind what they're, what they're working on. Um, use the formatting of the assignment description to make identifying requirements, deadlines, and tips easy. I'm just going to go over this really quick one more time. I just, Rachel's was just so nice. It's hard, if you don't know how to do this, if it's hard for you to do that, maybe you've got a TA that's good at this. I know I had a UTF last year that was really good at this kind of making it look so nice on a page. Um, but make it so it's easy for the students to pick things out, even if it doesn't look quite as perfect as Rachel's, but she has such a good one. Okay, provide suggestions for how students might approach the assignment. Um, and this is for English 2010 again. The content requirements. Okay. Going back to this first one that we kind of looked at earlier. Um, that was the really confusing assignment that you saw a few minutes ago and now it's very easy to figure it out what to do. Okay, go ahead. And then write it, so they've got the purpose, they've got what to do, and I liked this, what this, this professor does. The best papers will focus on this. The best papers will focus on this. Um, do you like that? Do you like that language? I don't know, I, I, like, I liked it. Uh, I think the students will pick right up on that and say, oh, I want to be one of the best papers. After you've written your assignment description, try to do it. Can you write a thesis for your own assignment description? Can you do it? Would you want to do it? Do you feel, feel enthusiastic about it or you go, oh, this, this is, would be awful. This would be hard. I would hate to do that. If you're thinking that about your own assignment, it's, you probably need to tailor it a little bit. Change it up. Can you do it? If you can do it and you're excited about doing it, then hopefully that will transfer to your students. Okay. Use good models of good writing to show as expected. Um, you could pick a, try to find a paper from a previous class that was a, a good paper, get their permission to use it in your own classroom. Um, you can highlight things, talking about the way that they've, highlight the way they've um, incorporated content into the, the paper and how they've used writing skills. They've got a topic sentence, so you can highlight some of those things right in the margins, scan it, and put it on your canvas as a model. Students love models. When they come into the Writing Center, they love to have a model to look at. What, is a, what do you mean by a model? I don't understand. A model paper? An example. Oh, okay. An example of what would be a good paper or what not to do, too. You can use models and examples in, in both ways. Okay, Jazz. Okay. Um, to finish off, we wanted to give you a couple of the tips that we give students. These are seven things that we show students that make the biggest impact on their writing in the shortest amount of time. So if they're focusing on these seven things, their writing improves substantially. So the first one is to narrow and specify your topic. I'm going to show you an example really fast. 
I could give you this as your topic. You need to write about the importance of reading to kids. We could fill out a million different little note cards of all the reasons it's important to read to kids, right? There's a million reasons. But if I told you to write about the importance of reading aloud to children with dyslexia, how many of those main ideas get tightened, get more specific? What kinds of research are you going to find that's specific and deep and meaningful in the second one compared to the first one? Um, the more often you specify what you're asking for and specify what the students write about, the more that they're able to show you their content knowledge. The next one is to include a thesis statement. This one's universal. Um, and one of the handouts I give you gives you many different points about tips how to write a good thesis statement. And I'm not going to delve too deep into what that is. But ask your students to write a thesis statement. If one cohesive idea doesn't tie everything together, that probably means the paper is going to be scattered. And it's really hard to write a good paper with scattered ideas. All right, the third one is to break it down. And this is what we love to do to help students not feel quite so overwhelmed about what they're doing. And this is a concept that revolutionizes most students' world. One paragraph equals one main idea. You only cover one idea in each paragraph. Really simple. But one page generally contains two paragraphs. And we can all generally agree that the first paragraph and the last paragraph make up the introduction and conclusion of a paper. So knowing this, we can actually put together a formula of how many main ideas students need to think about in order to construct a paper. So this is our example here. If, a, uh, if you ask your students to write a four-page paper, you are essentially asking them to write an introduction, a conclusion, and identify six main ideas related to that prompt. So this is, can help you as instructors decide how long should a paper actually be. Do you need a 15 page paper? Do you need that many main ideas to establish your, um, to help students learn what they're supposed to learn? Or can it be achieved in a four page paper or a three page paper? This concept helps students get their minds around how much they have to write and it breaks it down. If you tell them to identify six things, that's a lot easier than telling them to write for pages on end. Most effective tool when you're giving them the outline. Yeah, yep. This is wonderful for outlining, and this is also a great way to help students retreat back and look to make sure that they've actually accomplished what they were supposed to in their paper. Next one um, logically, start with simple and go to more complex. This works within a paragraph and a paper. So, um, start with key terms and background information, start with simple connections that are easy to identify and then move on to connections that are a little bit more complex. This is the logical solution that helps students break out of that five paragraph essay format of three main points in their paper that are um, different. And they just list, these are my three main points. Um, this helps them create a flow within their paper and in their paragraphs. Next one, topic statements. Topic statements are the very first sentence in each paragraph. If you treat it more like a thesis statement than a topic statement, um, you're going to change your paper. This is what I tell students to do if they only have an hour to revise their paper. This is what they go to. You can start with another study shows the importance of understanding PTSD. This tells us what they're going to talk about, but it doesn't really tell us what they're going to talk about. This revised one says, understanding the symptoms of PTSD can dispel common misconceptions about war veterans. This is a main idea. This is an assertion about something. This isn't just saying, announcing a topic. This is saying something about it. And if they can do that in the first sentence of each paragraph, they're going to keep their readers on the same page with them throughout the entire um, paper. And this is just another example. Um, the next one is aim for clarity and concision. The purpose of writing is to communicate ideas. It is not to be fluffy. It's not to be ambiguous. It's not to be verbose and impressive. It's to communicate ideas. And if you can, if you can convey that to your students, that's how they need to learn how to write. And that's where they'll learn that good writing is um, important. And the last one is to revise. Um, talk it out loud with a friend. Read the paper out loud. All those grammar errors that we talk about, if you tell them to read every single sentence out loud and slow down, I can guarantee that they'll catch so many of their own mistakes. And that proofreading issue becomes less of an issue. 
And finally, um, we have multiple resources for you online. Um, they're actually under resources, not under services, but there's a teacher resource. All the handouts you have will have this presentation and more um, for you. So, thank you. Do you have any questions in just the brief moment that we have left? We have a lot of information that we've covered. Yes? Do you have any resources for people who are interested in having their students do science and like, We don't have anything. Or, well... Well, we sure do. Our science, our yes. social director of <laughs> science is right there. We have a new science writing center. So, this is Kendall. <laughs> I met colleagues of our speakers today, um, and um, I work with the science writing center, which is a branch of the writing center. Um, and our website's under development right now, but we already have some resources. Um, and anyway, yeah. Yes, yeah, and send your, send your students. Yes. The writing center's just down the, the hall. Yeah. Yes. I'm almost familiar with the scientific grade, uh, and so I was curious about the use uh, of abstracts to uh, design assignments, perhaps, rather than use them uh, as a final thing. Sometimes you can it is a compilation of the uh, important statements. And students struggle with that about some of the things in scientific writing. So, comments or thoughts on use of uh, abstracts is that, uh, in developing uh, informative, critical thinking in the way. Yes. Well, I think it's for you to write the assignment description, you mean, or, are you, or for your students to write, you're asking them to write an abstract? Yeah, an abstract. Uh, yeah, I think. I mean, that's. A, I. I mean, I've done that in my classes several times with the, with a longer. They're writing a ten-page essay, and I have them submit an abstract first. Yeah, I mean, that's a. That's a good. A really good assignment. Mm -hmm. You've got something to what say. What I find really helpful in cases like that is I make a video announcement of me writing an abstract in the process I go through to do that. It seems to be really helpful for them to understand like, the difficulties that I face and the research I might have to go and do and figure that out. So they see me doing it and they can understand that process. Um, I wonder if you could just talk a little bit about um, uh, reviewing students. I mostly work with short, you know, one, two page essays. And I always, you know, comments, suggestions, um, criticism. And yeah, you're right. I just totally ignore the grammar stuff because it's, <laughs> it's the content's so rough. Um, and I, you know, so I write, I, I work in Canvas, so I write, you know, comments. But sometimes, I don't know, is that effective? Is it not effective? Um, I, what do you think? I mean, I, my expectation is that Maybe an undergraduate versus graduate is different. The graduate, you know, I really expect them to read those comments and in incorporate them. But I, great, I evaluate this essay is the same, whether it's graduate or undergraduate. I, I don't know. Is that, is that a good thing to do? Or? One of Just the a really brief response. <laughs> and we'll yeah. um, one of the things that we value about the Writing Center is we have time. We have time to have the dialogue. I think students don't often read comments because they don't have time. It doesn't apply to anything in the future. Um, so I'd really suggest sending your students to the Writing Center. They get forms emailed to them that say exactly what they worked on after they have an appointment. And they're talking through the process. They're talking about revisions the entire time. They have the time to dedicate. And they can send that information to you as soon as they're done. You can incorporate that into your assignments as well. But I think it's the time that mostly mm -hmm. students have issues with. 